Welcome back to God's Business, where I interview the top Christian influencers, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders on how you can create not just a good business, but God's business, where he's the multiplier of your success. This man here is held in high esteem by many people that I know. I met him in humble beginnings when Amanda and I literally had to negotiate for tickets to events and could hardly afford anything. I think we probably sleep, slept in a hotel room at this event with another couple or something like that. And I remember meeting this guy, my wife talking about him, and we got to interview each other back in the day, which I'll even link this. It'll be super embarrassing. It'll be the audio version, but we were passing around a microphone at an event, couldn't afford a studio set up, none of those things. And he is just always so great and nice to us. And as I started hearing other people talk about not only his book now that you guys can get below, but also just his success in the SaaS industry, the people that have been coached by him. My clients have been coached by him. He has an entire event in town right now of people that are high-end clients of his. Just been a super impressive guy, but even more than that, has been faithful inside of his marriage, inside of his body, which we just talked about. So at the very end of this episode, make sure to check that out because he's going to pull up the shirt. So check it out on YouTube. But welcome, Mr. Dan Martell. That's awesome. Dude, I mean, in many ways, the work you used to do with uh, your clients, the billion dollar body, yeah. I mean, you get it. I mean, I think that's what I connected with you and Amanda was not only, because um, there's a lot of people that that have aspirations to be in relation and like, you know, be the couple, but like you guys did the work, like watching Amanda's transformation, yours, the the work you, you guys have done and just literally seeing the evolution. I mean, I don't get to see as much as I'd like, but watching from afar it's been it's been really great to see so Thanks i appreciate you uh having me yeah absolutely and it's cool that you saw that back then you know when you're back in the day like 20 but dude you were what how old were you bro when we I, first met exactly that's what i'm saying i had but, it, but it's so rare like like even today 23 it's, yeah i don't i mean 23 married put your fitness first put your faith first like yeah, yeah. put your relation i mean that i, I could tell like if I've gotten good at anything in life is picking, like finding great people and almost like, you know, buying stock in them. And and that is inviting you to a founder's dinner or, you know, checking in on you or whatever it is or sending you clients. So like, yeah, you, you, you put yourself out there. And, yeah. I, and I honestly, I hope most people, more people do that because it's actually like what's required. Yeah. You can't help somebody if you don't know they're there. A hundred percent. So even going back to like your, let's say you back in the day, because for me, I look at it. I remember going to rooms at my first mentors, you would take me to rooms like this even. And you'd be like, just don't say a word. Mm. Just don't talk. Mm. Right. Cause it's like, you're not valuable, but you can sit here. Mm. And then even 23, you know, I'm like, that's nice of you to say now, but at the time it was many like rejections and no one cares about what you're talking about, what you say. So you're mostly just taking notes. And a lot of the things that I talk about now, even in the health side, are the exact same things I talked about then. Now everyone, or at least in my world, everyone's very keen to listen, right? And it's been consistency over years. But for you, how, what was your dynamic like in the beginning? Were people not listening to you in the beginning when you were maybe younger? And is there anything that you saw that kind of like you, you say the same things now that you said then, but now people are listening? Like what's the... What's the evolution of that? Because when you're saying this, this is like rare to me. Yeah, I think uh, what what I feel called to share is how do you, and I can talk about kind of how it's evolved, but how do you have conversation in a room where, where be, being honest, like you are the smallest person in the room revenue wise or the least known or the least successful or whatever you want, whatever. You're like in a room that's way bigger than you. Yep. Cause that, that's, that's hard. And I grew up in a small town in Eastern Canada. And I remember the first time I ever was in a room like that in my early twenties, I was, I, I didn't know what to do. Honestly, I was, I was in my hotel room going like, do I even go? Yeah. Like, cause there's only a doubt, like I could either go and go neutral. Cause I'm not going to say anything or I go and I say something stupid and I go down. So yes. like, if I stay in my room, I know what tomorrow's going to look like, Oh yeah. but you know, got the courage and went and, and over the years, one of the things that I've learned is it doesn't matter what, you know, and the whole levels thing is kind of, a, I think it's a dumb concept anyways. I think I love people's character. You know, I tell my my wealthy friends all the time, if you lost it tomorrow, I will still love you. Yeah. So I want you to know we're buddies, not because you have a podcast, not because of what you can do for me, not because of who you know or anything. It's because of your character. So if people could understand that their self-worth comes from the inside, 
God, right? Because let's be honest, like I think people don't take God with them in enough situations as they should. Then really, how do you create a positive experience for the other person? So my whole thing is, is I think you got it right. It's like I show up and I listen, but you, I love what you said. I took notes. Oh, yeah. Like when somebody comes Still up to, to me day, bro, and, and let's say I'm at dinner, like last night we hosted a big founders dinner and like somebody new comes up and I don't know them and they just sit there. See, most people make the mistake of wanting to talk, right? Because they're like, I need this person to know I'm not an it, like I'm, I'm, I'm somebody that's worth listening to or I have a voice. Don't even bother. Just sit there and listen attentively, write notes. Oh, that's a good idea. Oh, thanks for sharing that. Da, 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 da. Be curious. See, what I do, it doesn't matter even at, like when I meet anybody. Okay. I don't care if it's a comedian that's just getting going to, you know, a very, a billionaire. It's, I'm very curious up front to understand who they are, what makes them, who they are, how do they think, what are their point of views, what are their beliefs, what are their values. And I'll just ask questions and I'm always looking for, Something that is an uncommon commonality, right? What is something about this person that I can, like, there's a thread I can pull, right? That, and you can, you know, when you get it, right? Oh, yeah. Tell me, you know, what'd you do on the weekend? Well, I did this. Oh, jet skiing. How long have you been doing that for? But, so, so then you find that out. And once you have that, then you can ask them about like, how did you get started in this industry? You know, was it ever tough? You know, I'm facing this. I'm just curious. What about your journey? And when you get people talking about themselves, it's their favorite thing. Two things. One, they, they love the sound of their name use their name back to them. Nicholas, hey man, so good to see you. Oh, Nick, that's awesome. You know, so like repeat that, find the thing that they are passionate about, ask them about their journey. People love to tell, they love to talk, they love to tell stories. So the cool part is it takes the pressure off of you having to carry the conversation. But then here's the kicker, because this is what people don't understand how I have conversations with some of the top entrepreneurs, business people, is I look for an opportunity to help them. So I have a skill. I don't care who you are. There's something you do probably better than most people. It's the thing that your friends go, man, you're really good at that. So I want to ask questions to the person around that pain point. Okay. So for yeah. me right now, social media. Okay. Our, our team has been crushing it. We've 3X all of our platforms. We're really good at media right now. So I might ask a question. It's like, you know, what are you guys doing on Instagram? Or what's your YouTube strategy? Or have you ever thought of doing more videos online? Have you ever thought of doing speaking? Have you ever thought of writing a book? Yeah. Right. Now, obviously, if they've written 17 books, you got to make sure you don't ask a dumb question. Yeah. But in that answer, they then start to explain, oh, you know what? I've been wanting to do that, but I just I don't even know where to start. It's like, oh, let me tell you how I did it. Yeah. And then what I always try to do is then find an opportunity to say, you know what? If you want, why don't we do a 30 minute call? I'll, I'll do 15 minutes. I'd love to learn more about that thing you're doing. That's that's crazy. Like I also try to find something that they've done that I need to learn. And then I'll do a 30 minute conversation. Half of it is is me learning that. So then they they feel like they're pouring into me. And then the other half, we switch it. So I do this almost every week. Wow. Yeah, 30 minute calls, 15 minutes each. We switch roles. All right, I got what I needed. Hey, let's talk about your thing. What kind of book would you wanna write? You know, what have you considered? What are the top topics? Hey, let's let's do an outline. Let's do something together. So I think like that strategy is a way for you to feel comfortable amongst people that you see further along. I mean, this yep. worked for Richard Branson, for Mark Cuban, for Dana White, for Tony Robbins. Yep. Like I've met all these people and I'm always trying to figure out where, like, how do I get them sharing their story? And then what can I do to add value? And in a world of talk, this is a way that if, if let's say even when I was in 2016, I was pretty good at the health game, like I, or else I wouldn't have created a product. If I were to have come to you or someone else and they had some issue and I go, oh, well, let's jump on, we'll build out the plan. And then let's say it worked, like just astronomically worked for them for the first time. Now this super high stature person is like, oh, you're legit. And I, I had that happen on the sales side. I built a sales training company. I went in with a guy who built a Inc. like a single digit Inc. 5000. And I was like, I'll do everything for free. I was like, I just, you, you're amazing. You guys don't know how to do this at all. I came in and our first five days of launching, we did 600K, which again, it's not so very much good. for them, but it was like, it worked. But even for me, for them, they didn't really think I was legit, legit at all, yeah. right? And in the world of talking, cause you're in the social game yeah. now, right? It's like a lot of people can be like, oh, I'm the best, you know, I'm so good at this. And so even what you're saying is so, so cool. Now, my question around it, because now we're on this topic of connecting these high-level people, you talked about working with Ed Milet. So kind of give me the balance between this of how do people get in those types of environments? What's been your best way 
for me, I have what I think is my best way, but how, how do you even get in those environments with those types of people, especially if you ha don't have the reputation that you do? But yeah. You're, you're probably still trying to get in rooms that you're I, like. I think you should always be get, trying to get in a bigger room, yeah. right? I think if you're the big dog amongst your, your friend group, you got to get a new friend group, right? Not that you can't be friends with them, but you need to spend time with people that will elevate you and expand you. I always, you know, if you're the, the wealthiest person on your street, you might want to find another street, right? Like, it, I think a lot of people that, especially if they're on a path, they forget how they acted when they started. And they stopped doing the thing that made them successful. So yeah. when I started and I didn't know anybody and I wanted to speak to the person that's on stage at an event, I did what you just mentioned, right? I tried to figure out who's the event organizer. How do I add value to that person? How do I get a ticket to the event? How do I show up and just be helpful? It's better for me to be backstage, you know, helping with the video crew than being in the audience, just sitting there and putting my hand up with one of a hundred or 150 people, right? Yep. So what I remember, I remember I moved to San Francisco. I didn't know anybody. I wanted to build my network. And I knew from previous experience, I mean, even Chandler Bolt, like I met him at an MMT event as a volunteer. I met you. You were volunteering at Amplify or how did you? I, I just got like, they did a promo for a buy one, get one ticket. Exactly. Yeah, so yeah. You, you figured out how to get in the room. Okay. Yeah. So like most people just stop of, I can't afford that. Okay. Oh yeah. Like we all know guys that, Bro, that, that charge tens of thousands work. of dollars for these rooms. If you show up genuinely helpful oh, yeah. and say, I will fly to that city on my own dime and I'm not going to be weird and I'm not going to fanboy and I'm not going to cause you any issues. I will literally stand there and run around for 20 hours, whatever you need, 24 hours a day. If you just need somebody to go to the store to get you something because somebody forgot something, I'll be your person and I won't ask you for anything and I won't expect anything from you. You'd be surprised how many people go, all right, and they'll loop in their events person. And all of a sudden you're at least in the game, you're there. Oh yeah. So that's what I did. I moved to San Francisco, didn't know a soul. I made a list of like the top five tech events and I reached out to the organizer. One of them, it was actually called FailCon. Her name was Cassie and she didn't know who I was, but my proposition was kind of like a bit of a stretch. And what I did is said, hey Cassie, I know you've got this event coming up in six months. You've got incredible speakers. Would it be helpful if I helped you recruit other speakers? If you give me the list, I will reach out to the speakers and get them to show up. And she's like, you'll just recruit the speakers. I said, no problem. Give me the list. I'll Dude, I remember she gave me the list. It's all, it's the top people. It's the Peter Teals. It's the, the, you know, the Jeremy from Yelp.com. Like it's all the top folks, the, the Reed Hastings from LinkedIn or the Reed Hoffmans. And, and this is what's crazy is I now had a reason to reach out to these people. Yeah. So all of a sudden I reach out to these people and I go to Jeremy Stoffelman and I said, Hey, you know, I'm uh, helping Ka Casey or Cassie, uh, organize this event, FailCon. I'd love to have you as a speaker. I put your name forward and, and I think you'd be a great fit. Here's the top. Like, and I really like, I kind of acted like a team member and he's like, Oh, let me check my calendar. It works out. I, I can do it. I was like, perfect. So I go back to Cassie and she's like, awesome. We got Jeremy. I'm like, yeah, you got Jeremy. So like, that is a way for you to understand what, where can you add value in that exchange, right? But it can be as simple as like, I have a video camera or I've got the time or I've got the, the desire. I mean, most people that I meet at events, okay? And I've seen folks literally show up as a volunteer three years and all of a sudden now they're an attendee. They're in attendance. Yeah. Their side hustle turns into their full-time thing, makes them qualify for the room. Now they're in the room. And, and I mean, this is just the pattern I've continued to see it. I did it for myself, but that's, I think people use like, I don't know anybody, I'm nobody, I don't have an audience, I don't have a business. That's, that. those should never be the reasons you stop. And you talked about that they ended up being in the room. I see also people get stuck kind of, oh, I'll just try to find my free way in. Yeah. Because you don't get the same experience. It, it's better than being at home watching cartoons. Yeah, like, or watching the YouTube replay. Exactly, so you're there. But if you're working, even running an event, you get a different experience than those in the event. Sometimes a better one, right? You get something out of pouring into people, speaking, but you need to be in the room as well. Totally. And so it's, I like that you even mentioned that they continue to have the next phase. Don't just stay there on the camera. That's fine. But if you're trying to get in the room, meet the people, absorb it, at some point, it's like, do whatever you can to to get into these bigger rooms. And I mean, that's what Amanda and I did. We, we joined Cole's thrive mastermind 2015 yeah when i was still cleaning carpets like they wouldn't Big let me move. in by the way yeah they no, They're my like, wife was qualify. trying to buy it without me. yeah and they they already knew from selling fortune builders yeah. that they were like no spouse 
spouse objection is going to be it. So she calls me and she goes, I really think we need to do these things, buy this thing. But that's because for us, it was our relationship with God. So she was like, I feel this. He's never going to say no mm. because he would never say no to me if I have a, a feeling towards something. So she calls me and I, what I felt God say was, if you say no, it could be a good thing. It could be a bad thing, but you're already doing the wrong thing because you're stifling something she wants to do. Mm. But if you say yes to her and she buys this mastermind, it could fail or it could succeed, but at least you're already doing the right thing. Because mm. I've like, why would she ever try to put my family in debt and ruin my entire yeah, family on this decision? she really wants to do. Yeah. And so they were thinking, then they said, you're too broke. Like, yeah. we are not going to take your money. Yeah. Which is very nice to them. That's when you know you're broke is if a salesperson <laughs> won't take your money. Luckily, it was Cole's dad, so I think he wasn't as savage as some of the, like yeah. I would have been. Yeah. I'd have been like, give me my 2% yeah, yeah, yeah. commission Show collected. Up. Yeah, yeah. it's just, it's interesting. And even throwing a, a two curveballs on you. So I want to hear about your faith journey, because for me, I didn't grow up in a church. And even it kind of evolved as an entrepreneur, because I would say the people I was influenced by kind of, made me kind of a middle ground of what I believed. Not not totally, but just in my actions. Yeah. But first you had talked about you went to a tech event. I'm in this phase right now. I got into internet marketing because from carpet cleaning, because that's mm -hmm. what my dad did, because I showed up somewhere. I got very lucky. If I didn't, I maybe would have just stayed in the carpet cleaning industry and try to think about how I could build a better carpet cleaning company. And now I'm even looking at the phase going, okay, who's on the Forbes list? What are they doing? because I fell into this. Now I want to be proactive in my next phase of what's the best opportunities. You said you got into tech. Why Why tech? And then why have you kind of stayed in the environment that you're in with SaaS, SaaS founders and stuff like that? Because I'm assuming that's strategic. So like, how did you fall into it and why have you kind of stayed in this area? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, and I, and I share a lot about it in my book, but I grew up in, you know, addiction. My mom was an alcoholic. I'm second oldest of four. And bro, did you see how your book starts? I was like, bro, this is like Dude, this went was, zero to a hundred real know. quick. The first line, me and my editor, we, oh my, we, oh my God. Yeah. Not to interrupt you, but I'm like, you talk no, about addiction. I, I go, I, and and oh my dude, God. when I was writing that, my dad called me and he goes, I don't think your mom wants that out there. I Thanks said, for your consideration. Yeah. <laughs> mom, really dad, mom, did he, she call you? Does she even know I'm writing a book? And he's like, you know, and it was fascinating because, you know, we, we had a lot of trying times. I mean, my whole family, my brothers, we were all in, in trouble with the law. You know, my mom struggled with her demons. And, um, you know, I, I, I definitely, if you want to like, who is the worst, we were all did things that we we're not proud of, but I'm the, I, it's for some reason I always got caught. It's like the weirdest thing. Yeah. Like my dad jokes about it. It's like you and your two brothers would do the same thing, but you're the one that but, gets But arrested. like, why? Like you had like genetics or like, um, I, well, I was diagnosed with ADHD when I was 11. So I had a lot of, I had a lot of energy. Yeah. Um, it was misguided. I think my dad was traveling a lot. So he was always gone for work. Yeah. He was in sales and I think I learned later in therapy and conversations that when I acted out at home, my mom had to call my dad and he came back. So, in, uh, so, so even though like it wasn't the attention I wanted, it was attention. And, but yeah, I got put in uh, foster care, group homes, crisis centers when I was, you know, 11, 12, 13. Yeah, it was, it Dang. was, it was pretty crazy. J because you were so bad? Yeah, the, yeah, wow. yeah. No, my parents couldn't, I couldn't be at the you house. Booted. Yeah, I was, I was they felt it wasn't safe and, wow. and I wouldn't say they were wrong. Wow. Yeah. I used, I, I was, I was filled with rage. It's crazy. Cause you know me and like, yeah, yeah. It's and, and even, sharing, it's only off camera normally that you're filled with. Yeah. 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 Usually you only scream at <laughs> yeah, yeah. my face yeah. when the camera's not on. Um, and, but yeah, so I just, I got in, I got turned on. My parents got divorced when I was 13. Um, and they never said this, but I always felt it was my fault. And then yeah. I got uh, introduced to drugs at the same age. And dude, I the one thing about me is if I do something, I go all in. Yeah. Right. That's why I don't play golf. Cause man, if I got into golf, I wouldn't be doing this. I wouldn't be writing books. I'd be like, hey, we, let's we go on the PGA golf, tour. The way, but yes. Can't do it. Um, but yeah, I ended up uh ended up in juvenile detention the first time when I was 15. Got out. So I was gonna change my life. Ended up right back there, like within 
18 hours, just like not back in juvenile detention, back in the same group of friends, drunk, high, partying. And then um, it was when I was uh, 16, I ended up, you know, just selling drugs, hanging out with, it's kind of like, if you ever seen the Sons of Anarchy? Yeah. I, I hung out with those kind of people, right? At 16, they're like 25, 30, 40. And I was learning stuff I shouldn't have been learning. So yeah, I ended up, uh, cops were waiting for me at my house. My brother calls me up and says, don't come home. You know, they're waiting for you. I had guns in my room and, you know, drugs. And I uh, end up stealing the car and decide to, to go on the run. Did you say a gun in Canada? Oh, yeah. Yeah, back then. Now, today, you can't have a gun. I was going to say, bro. Yeah, they were I, rifle. I mean, you know they were rifle. Canadians come to my Hunting events? Rifles. And, they, yeah. and they're, the, and they're the, this is the first gun they ever shot in their whole life. Dude, I, I, and they're like 30 something. Yeah. Yeah. I, they've never shot a gun. Yeah. I was, we did an event, uh, in Arizona four months ago. And when I found out there was a shooting range, I was like, let's go shoot guns. And what was crazy is we, we go to the shooting range, the whole, the whole media team's there. And I, you know, they're like, what do you want to shoot? And I'm like, I don't know you, you, what are the funnest guns to shoot? You make it like make oh, yeah. a list. And he puts them all on a stack oh, yeah. and then gives me how many bolts you want. So I don't know. We're here for an hour. Gives us all the bullets, and then just hands it to me. Yeah. Like, didn't ask me for ID or nothing. Handed it to me. Says, that's the range. I was like, so I just Shoot picked this up. Way. Dude, in Canada, A, those guns are not allowed. B, they would have they would have carried it with you. They would have loaded the guns. They would have trained you. They would have made you sign paper. They would ask you for, there's, there's gun, you, like, there's zero, none of that. And it was just like the craziest experience, so. Well, and I've shot guns since I was three. Yeah. So it's kind of like this. You know, you just, just get guns of, your yeah. whole life. Yeah, you and drink water, you shoot guns. Exactly. <laughs> That's like the first thing you get a kid when they're cognitive for Christmas. Yeah. Is it, first it starts with the BB guns and then you get to the small shotguns and all yeah. that stuff. That's so funny, man. Even here, the range. Have you been? No. Someone will take you. Okay. And I will next time you come in, I can make it happen. <laughs> they can, they'll do automatics. So you yeah. can do like an MP5 automatic, fully automatic I'm silence. Man, I'm still a kid. Man, I'm they have like... an uh, upstairs room that's like a country club for shooters. Come it's on. It's like a cigar lounge, like yeah. really high that end. That sounds thing. a lot of fun. Yeah. The guy races Ferraris, the owner. So you'd, you'd like it's called altogether. the range. Yeah. Because you you had the McLaren, right? Is that your? Still got, yeah. Yeah, yeah. A new one, but yeah. yeah I'm a McLaren one. fan. Yeah, just because Nick, your friend, Kuzmich, Kuzmich has the for sure. McLarens yeah. as well. Yeah. 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 He's the one that uh, told me to get the one I got. Um, we, we're literally neighbors in Kelowna. That's amazing. Yeah. So, and the wake surfing. I'm all about the wake surfing. Dude, nonstop. Summertime. Yeah. But yeah, so, so what happened is um, I went through a really dark period, ended up in rehab, and it was at the end of, you know, 11 months. Well, I ended up back in jail doing doing rehab and I discovered programming and it literally saved my life. You wow. Know, I think that was the first time God came into my life. I didn't know that at the time. Yeah. Just something clicked. Dude, it makes no sense. There's this old computer just sitting there in an old church camp and a yellow book on Java programming. And I just open it up and read it and follow chapter one. And that was it. I became obsessed. That's hilarious because some people actually find like a Bible in rehab or like a, or I, I did, I turned to God, but, but also I, yeah. you're like, I opened the programming book and it just yeah, that came to life Bible. to me. Yeah. <laughs> the, like the, the red letters, they just hit me. It hit me. Yeah, no. And that, that was, it was funny. Cause I, I was in the, <laughs> when I got out my dad, like I was trying to figure out what I was going to do in my life. And I thought botany or computer program. Cause I used to, I used to grow a lot of weed. And my dad's like, mm, you can have a garden as a hobby, but I think you should do this computer thing. This is 97. So when I got out, I discovered this little thing called the internet. And that's been, so when you ask like why tech, why software, why SaaS, it's all I've ever done, but it's all I love. I love it. Like yeah, yeah. when I say I love it, like I love sitting down with, with, you know, companies I've invested in or, you know, entrepreneurs and looking at product and talking about the innovation and like what's in today's world, like what can, how can we grab this AI? What's the data set we're going to play with? What's the user experience? Cause I've got the full stack knowledge, right? I yeah. can go all the way down to the, the code level, all the way up to the user experience, you know, how the product works. I can talk about how do we get this in front of people? Um, how do we, you know, talk about it, the, the value it delivers, the position. Yep. Like I'm, that's my, that's my, the thing I do better than anybody else in the world. I see it now, even it's clicking as you're saying it is like my favorite sports motocross. So I'm going to Phoenix right now, uh, right after this, and I'm going to the waste management open. So golf, and then I'm also going to the motocross race. Golf makes far more money and it's going to be, you have way more fans like Rolex sponsors, all these For people, sure. the purses are 15 million or whatever it yeah. is. 
And in Supercross, it's nowhere near that. But those Supercross racers are not sitting there going, well, waste management's right down the street. I should pick up golf and maybe I'll get a bigger purse prize or all these things. They're so passionate and so deathly in love with their sport. And luckily there's a platform for it. Like it would suck if the internet was a thing of the past and no one cared about it, but you just love programming. Sure, there would have been a little bit of a deviation there because there is an opportunity, but just cool to hear that it's like the golfer, the tennis player, the motocross rider, where it's like, I got into this and I love this and I'm building the business. Dude, I think this is where, where, because, you know, I have a, you know, an audience online and I get, you know, 17, 15 year old kids asking me all the time, like, what should I do? And I'm like, do the thing that other people like that you naturally do the thing that you do better that other people find hard. Like, it's really that simple. Cause like whatever you're doing, if you, if you don't find it hard. Okay. So like everybody has these skills, they don't even know it. Yeah. It's like you, you pick up music and you're like, Oh, this just makes sense to me. And everybody's like, mur, mur, mur. like they don't have me. I don't, you know, they're a singer and they're just oh, yeah. like, it doesn't matter. Like to your point, motocross or engine stuff or whatever. It's like, whatever you do that other people find hard. That is, that is, I think God saying, Hey, go down this path. Because when you decide to commit yourself to the craft of the thing, mm-hmm. when every other person would give up because it's hard, you keep doing it. Dude, nobody had to convince me to stay up till two or three in the morning coding. My dad had to tell me, go to sleep. Okay. You have yep. school tomorrow. And I'd be sitting there, eyes burning. Like, I just want to get this thing to compile and I want to see it happen. And yeah. like, I just allowed myself and I didn't know it at the time, but I just, I became obsessed. And then the bit, dude, the business took me a long time. I started at 17, like legit started companies monetizing things I built. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until I was 24 and really 25 that I ever made money. Wow. So it took seven years of two failed companies. Finally, I built a company, hired a business coach, an e coach, and he taught me the business. side. I was a software guy. Yeah. You know, I could talk to you about, you know, object oriented programming and all that stuff, but I didn't understand, oh, how do we get it in front of a customer? How do we get them to pay? How do we deliver on that? How do we hire people? And, you know, at 26, 27, I made my first million, like cash million. Like wow. a lot of people today, they're like, oh yeah, I'm a millionaire. I'm like, you're an equity millionaire. Your yeah. home might be worth money. I'm talking like actually after taxes, million dollars in my bank account. Yeah. And it, and what was funny is nothing changed, zero changed. I did the same thing the day after my accountant called me to tell me this, and I did the day before, zero change, not even my confidence changed. It was just fascinating. I was like, fat. he's like, aren't you excited? I'm like, I'm busy building. Like, I don't, yeah. I'm having so, I'm, it was tough, but I enjoyed it. And that was like, you know, it's, it's a cliche. My daddy say all the time, if you find something you love to do, you'll never work a day in your life. He actually used to say, if you could just find something you're passionate about that isn't illegal, I think you'd do pretty good. Cause yeah, man, yeah. I, that's a great again, I would just do I, it, when I, that's why I don't golf. Cause when I would just take something on, he would just laugh at how I used to skateboard as a kid and I would just sit there with a ramp. You know, he'd put, he just built like this ramp one time. It's just like literally a 45, it wasn't 40, but it was like an angled ramp. You go up, you mm-hmm. do a trick, you come down. It's like a flat, like, like a piece of plywood with some two by fours behind it, nothing complex. And I would spend hours in my yeah. driveway skating. Here's what I learned about life, skateboarding. The tricks I was working on, in my mind, I had accomplished them thousands of times in my mind before I ever got my feet to do the thing at the right time for the board to flip, to catch it, to land it. Mm-hmm. Th- like thousands of times while I'm in class, while I'm on the school bus, while I'm sitting in the driveway, while I'm having dinner, I'm like, okay, first off, Ollie, how do I make that work? Cool. Kick flip, backside kick flip. Okay. 360 flip, front side heel flip. Like I would just sit there and play like even dark slides. Like how do I catch the board in the right way? So it's funny when I coach people today and we talk about visualization, you know, and, and kind of like how to use the power of the mind. Dude, I was, I was learning this stuff at 15. And I just translated that into business. So when I was writing code, same thing. I visualized the software we were building. I visualized the solution. And then the business side, I visualized the team. I visualized, so I, I almost live in the future. Like, it's, yeah. and it's my happy place. Like I live in the thoughts of the future. Here's a crazy idea. Everything we see is the, the vision of people from the past. Yep. Everything from our clothes to this chair, to this podcast set. 
first existed in the minds of people in the past. So yeah. technically we're living in the vision of people from the past. And I love the quote that says, everything created in the seen world was first created in the unseen world first. There we go. Right, it, nothing can exist here without it first have existing. All you of it. You can't think of like a camera or, or anything, kickflip. It's literally you have to everything. Dream it out first. Everything has to be dreamed. Of a person, no different than you or me. It's also proven that you build desire through contemplating things, right? This would be like, Ooh, in I, my world, I, it was the yeah. food, right? I was yeah. like, hey, you can't sit there. And people would stay, they'd fake eat cake. This was like a big trend when I was getting into fitness. They'd fake eat it in the middle of the night so that they could like act like they were doing it. The problem was, is the more you thought about it, the more you you're desired it. That myelin, yeah. yeah, you're just sitting there like thinking about it all day. So you, you, you can build desire positive or negative through that. And, and so I love that you talk about that because that focus on desire, but also that your body can get better at things from rethinking through them. Totally. Right. This is why all the guys like motocross guys put a pillow over their face and they'll visualize the entire track. They know Dude, exact you lines. Fighter right? pilots, the fighter pilots on the yeah, deck of really. the, of the, the battleships are sitting there and they're doing, and, and you literally watch them and anybody that yep. doesn't know, they're like, is this guy having a seizure? And he's, and, and he's do and it's like literally <laughs> running seizure. through, that's what it looks like. Cause they're just, you know, doing this thing with their hands yeah. and they're turning around and it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's art, right? Yep. But it's 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 muscle memory. Yes. And I think what people are missing is the power of clarity, belief, and holding that. So most people don't know what they want. Yes. They know what they don't want. They don't know what they want. So having a clear vision, a primary aim, what is the outcome? And and I always say to the degree, and I talk about this in the book, to the degree that you can describe the future you want to create to the same level you can describe your current situation is the degree you'll be able to hit it. Wow. Yeah. Like tell me about your current business, 13 employees, 1.5 million in revenue, blah, blah, blah. Perfect. What do you want to create? More. Yeah. Better. Bigger. Vague. What does that mean? Not clear. Like how many employees? Of. Is it 137 employees and these three cities and, and you know, this really level good. of revenue and profit and gross margin and product suite? Like, like go there, live there. And then in that space, then we got to go to belief. You know, some guy, one of my uh, team members the other day, I was, I was sharing kind of like my leadership process and it has this concept of belief. And he goes, well, I mean, I hear what you're saying, Dan, but uh, I'm 5'10". I, if I believe I'm going to be 6'2", I mean, it's kind of dumb. I go... So you don't believe it. So do you believe you could be 6'2"? He goes, no. I said, exactly. See, what I believe is the belief matters and the how doesn't. See, if mm -hmm. you believe that you want to be 6'2", and you don't worry about the how and you don't worry about timeline, you give it to God. Yeah. I believe, because I've seen these miracles in my life, yeah. that somehow some person is going to create a thing that's going to allow you to get an operation and you will be 6'2". And in that moment, you will believe in God. Yeah. I just believe it or not. And that's cool too. Yeah. But I just, I just think most people are so quick to dismiss their dreams, so quick to dismiss the visions because it sounds ridiculous. Yeah. And I'm like, your ability to hold that as a truth and not worry about the how is what's missing. And then a hundred percent of the time. So like not when it's convenient, not on Sunday, not because you feel pumped up, but can yeah. you hold that 100% clarity of the future, 100% belief, 100% of the time to the degree you can do that, you actually pull into your life, the opportunities, the conversations, the people, the circumstances it's to really make it good. happen. I was in Russell Brunson's office and we were talking about just kind of Recently? these topics. This is, yeah, not Okay, because he's super got the recent. new, the yeah, new yeah, library not, that looks pretty awesome. Yeah, not super, not recently. This this specific time was not recent. And I remember seeing, the conversation was so good. He had his video team there for you know normal daily office stuff. We put up the chairs and we do full interview. And at the end of the the basic principle of the interview, the last part was like, all right, what's cre like what's created all this? Like he's done so well, very impressive, respectable. And the number one thing is he's like, if I could drill it down to one thing, belief, like that was the thing. And so based off what you just talked about, out of everything we could have talked about and every formula and every skill set and everything, it all came down to belief for him. Like that has been the number one thing. Dude, Nick, let's look at like, like people don't get it. They, the evidence is there. Yeah. If I ask anybody yourself, who are the people you admire the most? And you gave me the list. Yeah. Right. We we're talking about John Gordon. We we're talking about all these incredible people, you know, Pete Vargas, many. 
and and you you actually step back and at, like what makes that person somebody I admire? What I've seen almost 100% of the time, few things. One, they call their shots mm -hmm. publicly. Like, isn't that fascinating that people don't see the evidence? So what does that mean? For you to want to tell the world what your goals are publicly before you ever achieve them, that means you have 100% clarity and it means you have 100% belief. Somebody that doesn't believe in the future they could create, don't tell anybody. Correct. Why? Because they don't want to be held accountable to that. They don't want people to see them fall in public. They don't, because again, there's a timeline for them. Yeah. See, if you remove the timeline, but you hold on to the belief, then that that creates the intentionality, right? You said that. I love that you said that. It's the intentionality has to be there. The energy has to be there. And that's what's missing for most people. So the people they admire, they don't even pattern match. It's like, well, if you admire The Rock or whoever, Richard Branson, whoever you admire, wealthy Gary Vee. Dude, Gary Vee's been saying what for the last 20 years? Who, what does he want to buy? The Jets. For 20 years, do you, do you not realize that he's been calling his shot, holding that belief 100% for 20 years and, and probably before when he was 12, he was probably telling his friends when he was yeah, I'm gonna buy the Jets. I'm yeah. gonna buy the Jets, I'm gonna buy the Jets, I'm gonna buy the Jets. Yeah. And, and, and oh, and maybe now everybody's like, Oh yeah, he's probably oh, gonna yeah, do he's it. He's definitely gonna buy the that's Jets. That's crazy. He's probably that's crazy. Yeah. He's gonna Gary, do you know you could probably already buy the Jets. Come yeah. on, man. Like this is so easy for you. Yeah. yeah. So I just feel like we need to be inspired by the people we admire. And most people are not reverse engineering and pattern matching what those people are doing. Because the other thing they're doing is they're being a thousand percent themselves. Yeah. It's what we love about them. Is you know when that person speaks, that's just who they are. It's not filtered. It's not, it's not, you know, fear gives bad advice. It, it's not out of fear. It is a hundred percent who they are. And that is actually what we admire in them because they're there to show us that in us. And that's, that's kind of like, that's been my journey, man. Yeah. I'm very attuned to the, the people in my life, the Ed Milets, the John Maxwell's and say, what is it that I admire about them? Because that's probably an area that I need to amplify, that I need to expand on, that I need to investigate because maybe I'm not a 10 out of 10 there. Maybe I'm a seven, maybe I'm an eight, maybe I'm even a nine, but maybe there's another gear for me. That is interesting because in marriage, typically people marry an opposite or they're attracted to things totally. that they're not, right? But also on the opposite side of that, Typically, what people judge in others is usually their biggest problem. The so it's what they side. hate about themselves, right? Yeah. So it's interesting that you're like, right? That's why it says, why don't you take the log out of your eye before you take the speck out of your brothers? Because you're checking everyone else. But that's so you can get confirmation on your problems by looking at what you hate in others. Yep. And you can also get confirmation of the things that you need to improve in by what you're, what you see in the people that you're inspired by. Which my, is like my wife. Crazy. My wife and I are completely. Uh, different yeah. and compatible and best friends. Yeah, there's but, difference between values and- Yeah, but what I admire of her that she's brought into my life that I've expanded on is her deep desire for family, family unit, yep. dinner. Like I grew up and we never ate. I can't remember eating dinner as a family. Totally. Uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas, maybe. Other than that, it was like frozen meals, peanut butter and jam sandwiches on the go, running yeah. out the backyard. There was never a demand, a need. Nobody was ever asking, hey, it's dinner time. We're all going to eat here. Sit down. But and, and that part is what I love about her, right? And in the same breath, the opportunities for her to, to show me, right? This guy, Peter Crone, has this great quote. He says, the world will show you through people and circumstances where you're not free. So my wife shows me all the time yeah. where I have my, my work to do. Yep. And I actually, I think what's why we have children. Our children are there to show us the same thing. You know, like this oh, yeah. is, so if, if, if you can just go on that journey to say, hey, the people that inspire you, you should acquire that skill set, and the people that are in your life are actually perfectly placed there to show you where you're not free to do the work, to, to you know, all caps the work. I think it's just, you know, and your shadow side, man, we all have it. And I think that is what makes, a person full featured or full spectrum. Cause that's the other thing is you don't admire somebody that's always putting their best foot forward. The person's always posting the friggin' edited, perfect Instagram. Like you yeah. might watch, but you don't admire them. Yeah. But you look at somebody that's flawed, 
but you see them try. So yeah. some people, I, I, it's funny, entrepreneurs come to me and they go like, oh, what I'm doing is not that impressive. I said, what are you doing? They're like, well, I just quit my job. I'm inspired. Yeah. It's not about the size of the thing. It's the action and the, the it's you overcoming a fear regardless yep. of the size. Yep. So you could be starting off and we all like, dude, I watch, you know, social and it's like the golden buzzer you know, the golden ticket and me and my wife, we love these like reality shows because it's just so inspiring, right? Because you, it's such a core human belief to want to root for somebody that you know in their darkest days, decide to bet on them, to, to, to shine their light, to become, to try, you know, and, and put it like literally fail publicly in front of everybody, but they don't. It don't matter if it's ten dollars or a million dollars. It's it's the essence of why they did that. That yep. that is the human spirit, and I live for that. There's a guy Scott Donnell. He's out in in Arizona. He has a the number one app, Gravy Stack, for financial literacy for kids. And one of the big things he taught the parents, and I just brought him in, so this is fresh for me, was to praise their choices, not their gifts. So a lot of parents will praise their gifts because they do a good job mm -hmm. rather than the choice. And even what you're saying there, like when I'm watching people and they want to quit their job, I've also seen entrepreneurs that do pretty well that just make really dumb choices. I go, man, I, you made that choice? Like you put those things together? Like that is not how you become successful. Whereas there's other people that maybe they're in that beginning phase or they're, you know, they get to the game show. Like, bro, it's scary to go put your, I wouldn't go on a game show. You kidding me? I, like, I don't want to go up there and do the whole thing. And like the choices, right? Like the choices that people make is what makes them de not dependent on the, on the gifting. Totally. And so that there was just something about that that I thought was cool. You have Ed Milet, you talked about John C. Maxwell. You were just with him even. He also, I think he failed for like, what, seven years on his first book or something before? Long time. He, yeah. he didn't like, write a book like, for like, like seven years. Like the 21 years. Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. I asked him in the stack. He's, he, we were talking a couple of days ago in 90 bucks. You know, he goes, that impressive, Dan. It's 50, 52 years doing one thing. Yeah. You know, consistency compounds. And he he talks in books. It's so funny. Yeah, I go, yeah. like, he's like, hey, you know, I want you to speak in my event. And I want, I want to travel with you and learn from you. I go, John, you're the goat. He goes, yeah, but you know what I learned, bitter? Better people make you better person. <laughs> you know, bigger people make you bigger person. And he's just, I'm like, this is, I'm like writing these things His down. His principles just come out. He's just awesome. But yeah, I asked him what number was, you know, 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, because that was the first book I ever got turned on to John's work. And yeah. he was like, I think it was number 17. Like he, he wrote, he showed up, he did the work, he was yeah. consistent. And that one, you know, when you look at like long tail distribution of things, it's like 30, 40, 50% of the millions of copies of books was that one book. It's the number one leadership book ever sold in the history of mankind, da, da, da. And, yeah. and I just think like the, the, the thing I take away from that is being willing to do the work. I think the work instills the worth. And, but he's so teachable. So I'm at Hobby Lobby with the David Green and the Green family. And he was there for a meeting before, but he got invited to come and just check it out. Could have flown out. journal. Oh, this guy, he was there the entire time taking notes, listening to David Green. He gets up and does a share in tears about how his life was changed. And this was like six months ago. And I'm sitting there going, he's, John he said C. To me, Maxwell is in here taking notes, delaying his trip changing his flight anyone who's like you know i don't know how old he is right now but if he's someone's 73 in, i asked if him. someone's even 64 or something they're like oh i'm on my last leg my dad know. my dad always i only got 10 years left i'm like dad that's the weirdest thing you should never say that i yeah. only got 10 years left yeah no he literally said to me he goes i, I go why do you want to spend time with me like you and he goes just i want to grow he goes i've been I, I'm growing more today than I've ever grown. And then And, and I've learned a long time ago to get around people that other people I admire say, I got to talk to this guy. And I'm just like, I spirit animal, like John Mac, like you are yeah. the, I want to be you when I yeah. grow up. Like, thank you. Thank you for expressing yourself that way. Thank you for, I don't know, man. I I'm just like in such awe right now of those incredible people. Yep. So I think when I was younger, man, I'll be honest with you, I was cynical. There was a part of me that was cynical. Like, I, I think like, I'm a software programmer. A lot of software programmers are freaking cynical dudes. They're the most funniest. I love them because they're my tribe, but um, you know, they don't believe anything. 
they 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 see anything and they're like oh yeah that person oh yeah that's not his car that's this and he rented this and i bet him and his wife don't even sleep in the same like all these crazy like they're just cynical by nature i don't know why they just are Mm -hmm. i was that person so for a long time when i would see a tony robbins or or back you know i don't remember who i would have got i would always be like yeah but that person's probably a scam artist or that probably you know what i mean and I, i don't know where that energy came from but I just remember those thoughts. And as I get older and I realize that my frequency is what I frequently see, okay? And I have worked through that stuff internally. And all of a sudden I'm having these conversations with a John C. Maxwell, with a John Gordon, with an Ed Milet, with, with whoever. I realize that my energy is attracting those people and I get to see what I am. So yeah. The world isn't as it is, it's as you are. And a lot of people think, because you can go through the world and say like, you know, I think the world's broken. I think there's not enough. I think there's a lot of homeless. I think there's a lot of anger. I think there's a lot of like drugs and usage and violence. And guess what? You find will find it. proof. Totally. Or again, I who I am is I think that this world is full of abundance. I think there are great people. I think they're great Literally. humans yep. that come from a place of service, not selfishness. Yep. I believe that people want to give more than they want to take. I believe that that person is wealthy because they woke up every day consistently for 52 years and wrote 90 books to show the world and himself, the work and sales world, who he is. Yep. And guess what? I, I am in massive gratitude and awe and inspired, but not surprised that my world looks like this. And everybody's asking lately, Dan, how, cause you've watched my journey, man. I don't, I've never stopped, but what's changed is just the, the speed of expansion. Yep. But that's a hundred percent correlated to the internal beliefs yep. of what I think this world has to offer and how it was all created and yep. how I incorporate God into my life every second, not just on Sundays. And, and you had talked about even with soaking in for people. I just got done running an event. It was my best one. And I've ran about 120, 35 mastermind style events. And this was my best one. And it just changed me. I came home. I told all my friends, just texted them, I'm changed. And they're like, what? I'm like, I don't know. Something just in the environment, just something clicked, clicked. a lid popped off. My creativity has been going crazy. My dreaming, I'm more focused. I see where I'm going. Uh, But you had Ed, you talked about John, there's like Erwin McManus is in Dude, the pile. Er- Erwin. Erwin's great. Yes. Uh, yeah. Those are all powerful Christian leaders. Kind of walk me through your faith journey. I came from ministry, business, kind of like all of a sudden I kept myself in the club networking with people. And I was like, do I really want to be in the club all the time? Like, what am I doing? How have I strayed so far from like, I'd never even really drank before, not because of, for performance, yeah. not because I was religious. My dad was like, my dad drinks 30 pack of beer every day back in the day. But I was just like, I want to be in performance. And then all of a sudden I'm like drinking and network and I'm getting more out of shape and I'm sitting there going, bro, what am I doing? So for you, talk to me about your faith journey. When did you have an encounter with God? And obviously you surrounded yourself with these guys that are like giants in the kind of marketplace faith area. It, dude, it's been, it's been my whole life. Really? Yeah, man. I, I want to I be as clear, as honest and accurate as I can be. I turned to God when I got arrested the second time. I almost took my life in a high-speed chase. I woke up sober the next morning and I just, I just. So you woke up sober the next day? I I was, yeah, I was was high and drunk when I stole the car. And normally would you have been high and drunk or like, you know, still jacked up? Yeah, yeah, I would have been using every day. For a year I was, I was wasted. Yeah. And I just turned to God and I said, if you're real, I could use some help right now. Dang. And I didn't hear anything. I didn't feel anything. But I, and I didn't even have a big vision. I just said, look, I'm, I'm, I don't, there was no Dan doing anything in his life. I just, I promise I'll just not break the law. Yeah. I will, I will get sober. I will just be a good person. And, and I got sentenced almost two years. I ended up in an adult facility due to the severity of my crimes. Wow. And, and it was a journey. And, and I, I started reading the Bible. I couldn't, sorry. I couldn't read it, man. I was like, this doesn't make sense. Like I'm yeah. reading it, these thin pages, dude, in prison, they use the paper to roll cigarettes. Yeah. So like, it was so weird to like, so you had some pages missing. Yeah. There was pages missing <laughs> and ripped off and people are screaming down the hallway. Uh, like, Hey, who's got a paper? Da, da, da. And I'm just like, but I would, I would try. And, 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 and I was like, but nothing worked. And then I had people show up in my life.
I didn't know it at the time. But people I talk about him, Brian. He was an angel. Mark Pence was an angel. Keith. All these incredible humans in prison, the guards, the staff at this beautiful place called Portage that saved my life. My dad, like, he'll tell anybody Portage saved my son's life. All right, that's why I go, like, you know, two, three times a year when I'm around, I like go speak to the kids. Wow. And it took, dude, it took so long. Like I didn't have a relationship with God. It took yeah. forever. You know, I grew up Catholic. I thought the churches are dumb and stupid. Don't make me stand up, sit down, read a book, scream. I hate the music. Don't, I don't want to be here. This is weird. I don't know you. I don't trust you. I literally yeah. like, I look at my parents. I'm like, why are we here? Like, you don't believe this. Like you don't make any good decisions. Like it was just such a farce, right? And um, I mean, into my twenties, and then I had these moments, these these, you know, these connective moments, these spiritual moments, these um, a flood of gratitude. You know, these these miracles that showed up in my life, dude. It didn't make sense. How did I go through what I went through, and then all of a sudden I become a multimillionaire at twenty eight, and then go on to build another company. And when I decide to walk away from the earnout after we exit the company, okay, multiple eight figure earnout, I decide to go pursue my dreams. And six weeks after I make that decision, I get a call from my co-founder, Ethan. And he tells me, Hey dude, we just got bought for 700 million. And I was like, congrats for you. Cause I'm not there. I left. I walked away and he goes, yeah, but what you don't realize is because we got acquired in the, uh, acquisition terms, there's a vested acceleration schedule if the company changes hands. So you're going to get your earnout. But you were also okay with not. Oh, I walked away. I wow. bet on myself. It doesn't make sense. And then it was probably six, seven years ago where I, I started turning into faith. But I didn't, I didn't go to the Bible immediately. I went to con, like, um, what it, you know, daily devotional devotionals. Yeah, yeah. Cause I, I've, I've always been a, I'm, I'm a belief collector. I mean, it's actually one of my core tenets. I, I read, I study books. I'm looking for positivity. I'm looking for language I'm looking for. And I started reading spiritual devotionals and that was kind of the beginning. And then dude, it was so funny. I think it was around thrive. Yep. All my friends, I didn't know were Catholic. They were, they were, they were followers of Jesus. Yeah. So here I am in a business community and I love these people. They're my best friends. Pete Vargas, yep. Keith Yaki, all these people, uh, Cole. And I'm just like, what? You, you too? And they're like, yeah, man, I just love Jesus. I'm like, what version of Jesus you love? Cause like what, what you, you read, you read the Bible, you read the old Testament, you read, and they're like, well, and I'm like, tell me about it. And honestly, it was my buddy, Brad, one of my best friends. I talk about him in the book, Brad, Brad. And he, and I was, we would go snow biking, okay. In the back country mountains. And we'd drive for two or three hours in his truck. And I, I just started asking him questions. I just say, tell me. Cause I don't get it. But I want to get it. I see like, you're just such a good person. What do you know? How, how, how did you resolve this thing I believe in and this thing? And then dude, I, I got introduced to Erwin McManus uh, on a podcast. I think it was Ed Milet's podcast. And dude, he had a way of explaining things. I'd never heard anybody explain it oh, that yeah. way. And I probably listened to that podcast a dozen times. Wow. And I started sharing it with my brother. I shared it with my wife. I shared it with my business partners. And I said, I don't know where you're at on your journey. Yeah. But there's just something about the way this guy explains it. And out of the blue, dude, this is, this is beautiful. I get a message on Instagram from my buddy, Dan, Dan Bolton. Never met Dan. He was in a coaching program with one of my coaches, but he knew of me and we'd exchange message on Facebook. And I think I shared uh, a quote on my Instagram stories 
Like it was a, it was, it was like a spiritual code before that was business quotes, mindset quotes, transformation, like whatever. But it was, uh, it was, uh, it was, I think it was actually like scripture. And he was working with Irwin on his, his course, this, this, uh, the story one, I think. And it was like two or three years ago. Yeah. Speaking, I think. So. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And he entered, he goes, Hey man, I'm working with Irwin. I saw this. I talked to him about you today. He would like to meet you. <laughs> what? He goes, yeah, man. Is it cool if I get your cell number and share with, with Irwin? He'd like to talk to you. I, I'll, it'd been a while since I was that nervous. And I remember I was sitting in the parking lot outside the gym. Cause I was like, he's like, are you free now? And I'm like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let me just check. Of course. And it was so funny. Cause, and you can ask Irwin if you ever meet him. My FaceTime wasn't working. His was. And he stayed on FaceTime. So I'm sitting in my car. He can't see you. He can't see me. It's summer. I don't want to turn the car on because I don't want it to make noise with the air conditioning. Yeah. I'm sweating like so profusely. It's like a hundred and some degrees in the car. And I'm just sitting there watching Irwin at his house. And I asked him every question. At first, he asked me about the business stuff because I'm, you know, it's my thing. That's what he wanted to talk to me about launching and courses and stuff. And I told him everything, kind of what we were talking about earlier. I was like, hey, whatever I can do to serve. Yep. And then I said, Erwin, can I ask you a few questions? He goes, yeah, Dan, what's up? I said, I don't know about the Bible. <laughs> and he just laughed. He goes, that's okay. I was like, but I don't, I don't know. Like who wrote it? Why they, like I studied, I literally went down the path. I, I like looked at it. I was like, who are all these people? And why is it, ch why these books and not these ones? And there's a whole, like you actually look yeah, at yeah. the theology of it and I go, it doesn't make sense. He goes, that's okay. Yep. He goes, worry less about the words and, and, and build a relationship with Jesus. He goes, he goes, the funny part is you will be left with more questions and answers the more you pull on the string. Yeah. And that gave me so much relief yep. to go, oh, this is normal. And it was so funny because I thought I was asking him some like hard hitting questions. And he, he, I was, and at the end of it, I go, oh, you probably get these all the time. He goes, all the time. <laughs> oh, yeah. So that, that just continued to send me on a journey of getting to know. Jesus, what he stood for, I read, or wrote a great book called The Genius of Jesus. That gave me a great foundation. And then I would just talk to all my friends. I started going to this, um, this place called Metro, which we do service every Sunday with our, our homeless community. It's this beautiful place. Wow. I love the energy. Still not on board with the music. <laughs> I only go like 20 minutes after. There are certain songs that I love. Hillsong, Oceans. Dude, I I can't me and my kids just scream that song in the car yeah, yeah. the second half of it when it gets really good upbeat and and oh man uh what's his name uh chain breaker yeah. awesome song dude i was listening to yesterday like on repeat i so i think there's certain types of music but what i've given myself permission to do nicholas is i don't have i have a hard time with religion and dogma and i think most people do and i think that's what we're seeing right now jesus did too so it's good. Dude, that was the funnest part to study and understood yep. that if he was here today, he would be a little against what has happened with his words. Totally. So I, I just keep holding space for that. Dude, it is, it is impacting me. And oh, here's a fun fact. My wife is an atheist. Wow. Renee. Yeah. Forever. Dude, next to, so my books got the, next to my book, on, we go to bed. On my book, stand next to my bed is the genius of Jesus by Ron McManus. On her side is why 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 God is made up. Like whatever book she literally was reading, because she would because she would see my life evolve, and then I would say something like share some scripture or whatever, and then she would be like, "I don't believe in that." So she wanted to start reading and to to have an opinion. Yeah, which I which I love. I love that about my wife. Yeah, that's cool. Now, if you ask her. Mm -hmm. She loves Jesus. Wow. I knew it would happen. I knew, I knew eventually 
And I would talk to Brad because she would tell people, I'm an atheist. I know Dan's into this, <laughs> this Jesus guy or religion or whatever. And I would just be like, I would just hold space. There was no anger about it. There's no frustration. I thought it was beautiful. I loved, I loved her. I loved what I loved the fact that she was trying to educate herself and try to figure it out yep. for herself. And yeah, a couple of years ago, she just kind of and now she posts the most beautiful things. And yeah. And again, like even with my kids, I don't I don't push it on them. We they come with me on Sundays. Big reasons I like to play with their friends. And that's fine. I just want them to be in the energy of it. So like that is the current state of my faith is I believe. And and by the way, I also studied a lot of other religions. And that's what again, what I loved about Erwin's message. And it turns out that all of them are pointing to God. They're yeah. all talking about these, these values that it's just, you don't even like, you could live in the woods and never hear anything about anybody, but you know, in your heart, that is just a better decision. So yeah. it's, it's part of our, our spirit. I love what you said, even for your wife and yours relationship. Cause there's people out there. I talk to, I mean, I get in environments all the time where what I believe really influences the people in front of me. So they start feeling like they have to be a certain way. Yeah. They can't talk a certain way. They can't do things a certain way. And I always tell them, why should you have to believe what I believe when you didn't have the same experience that I had to believe what I believe? So I like for your wife, it's like, you don't, you don't have to believe what I believe because you didn't have the experience yet that I had. Yep. So, and, and most of them are like, they are scared to drink too much in front of me or to say certain words or whatever. And I'm like, dude, I don't, why, why would you stop? That makes you a hypocrite. I'm like, I had an experience that's made me want to live my life different. Yeah. If you haven't had the experience, why are you holding yourself to the standard? Yeah. If you don't believe it, like don't, you don't have to do that. And I think that that gives that same freedom as well. And yeah, you're right, man, the questions, it, it, even as an entrepreneur, there has to be a time when you were a kid and you started doing well that you thought you knew what you were doing. And right now oh, yeah. where I'm at, I have more questions about health, business. I'm more curious and like know more of what I don't know than I definitely did, especially in 2017 yeah. when things started going well. I remember hearing speakers, one of them in particular, he was teaching something that I had heard Russell say, not knowing that it was actually from a speaker trainer like 20 years before that. And I wrote off everything the dude said. I was like, I already know this and you you're copycat and I'm not listening to you. I even vocalized it like yeah. a total- You went to dude. social? No, no, no. I went I, in the room. Yeah. I'd be like, oh, I bet the next thing he's going to say is this, blah, blah, blah. You know? You got super and I'm judgy. sitting there like- this guy has done 20 times the revenue that I have. And I'm sitting here as a 20, you know, four or five year old yeah. thinking I literally know it. So just, I think that's really cool, man. I appreciate you obviously for being here. I have two copies here now. I have a signed copy from you. Yeah. And I also have a copy. This one's from Pete. It says right here. Beautiful. Written by my friend, Dan. Uh, I think I have another one in my house as well. So, so I'm just cool. kind of like have enough for every single bathroom, at least not every there we room. Go. Um, but I appreciate it, man. It's, I'm so impressed with with what you've done. and uh, It's an honor, man. And just watching you continue to expand. Dude, you're just a young cat, man. Like, get yeah. it. Again, dedicate a decade, dedicate 50. I mean, John, 52 years. Like, I can't wait to see your star continue to rise. Thanks, man. So uh, who should grab the book? Is there anything else that they should get connected to? You talked about your socials blowing up. Yeah, yeah. Instagram so, is my favorite. Dan Martell. Dan yeah. Martell, 2 L's of Martell. Follow me on Instagram. I will show up every day for the rest of my life to inspire you to live a bigger life. That is, it's it. actually in the book. You may not even know this, but inside the jacket, live a bigger life. Dang. It's actually, this really got my publisher upset. Wow. Yeah, because they don't usually do that. Oh, got them upset because they had to do it? Yeah, heck yeah. So yeah. just do it for that. And then also the story that you talked about in the beginning, yeah. you talked about on yeah, the road, Yeah, it's for gone. entrepreneurs. It's for, for leaders. It's for anybody that wants to understand. See, it's the I wanted to teach people how to build a business they didn't grow to hate. It turns out it's how to build a life you don't grow to hate. Yep. Because it's going to create the space for you to do the work. That's why this book, I think, is important. Boom. So I'll have it down below for everyone. Buy back your time. And even the the first story with the gun, the driving, that's oh, yeah, there. but also the systems and stuff. And you walk them through a lot of different things that are really, I'm really such good. a systems nerd. Yeah, it's yeah, in yeah. there. Well, I appreciate it, man. Thanks for coming on the show. Appreciate it, bro.